Dr. Nisa Ari uh, is going to present to us Wasteland, Promised Land, Homeland, Painting Flora Palestina Before the Nakba. Uh, Dr. Nisa Ari is Associate uh, Professor of Art History and uh, Montserrat College of Art in Beverly, Massachusetts. Her research has been published in Third Text, Arab Studies Journal, and Threshold, and has been supported by numerous fellowships, including the Center for Advanced Study in Vi the Visual Arts, the Mellon Foundation, American Council for Learned Societies, the Terra Foundation, among others. She earned her PhD in the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architecture program at MIT. Uh, please have the floor. Great. Thank you. Is that on? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you and thank you to Az for the first presentation. That was really inspiring. Thank you. Um, I, I will say that it is really intimidating to be on this side of the table after three days on the other side <laughs> and hearing the collective brilliance of everyone who's taken part. Um, both the speakers and the people who have been asking questions. I've also learned a lot from people's comments in the room. Uh, and I do want to thank very much the organizers of this conference, uh, in particular for giving us a chance to talk with each other and not at each other, uh, which is often how conferences feel. So I, I really appreciate you, all the hard work that went into making that possible for us. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So sometime in the mid-1940s, we believe, the multi-talented Palestinian writer, translator, artist, and art critic, who many of you are familiar with, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, painted a vision of a woman resting in a blue-green meadow filled with blades of overgrown and wind-blown grass. Red anemone flowers, indicated by small globs of red paint polka-dotted across the field, form a loose perimeter around the woman, making way for her figure. And the woman, in turn, pats them gently as she shifts her weight and nestles her left hand into the ground. Jabra's painting evokes a moment of symbiosis between the human and natural worlds, where both seem not merely to tolerate, but to support and complement one another. I have long been intrigued by this painting because Jabra made this placid vision sometime between 1945 and 47, during the immediate years leading up to the Nakba when Palestinian land and Palestinian life underwent rapid and aggressive transformation. Whereas Palestinian writers of the same period deployed imagery of inhospitable lands to express the transformations Palestinians experienced in the first decades of the 1900s, sometimes metaphorically, sometimes quite literally, of what was happening to the land, I have yet to locate a single Palestinian painting from that period that does the same. Instead, the primary subjects of early 20th century Palestinian painting were bucolic hillsides, meadows with colorful constellations of blooming wildflowers, still lifes of the region's lush botanical and agricultural specimens, and more rarely views of architectural landmarks and homes, in addition, of course, to the icons and religiously uh, themed or genre paintings explicitly intended for the religious tourist market or people's homes. Palestine's wildflowers, as we all know, with their vibrant hues and various textures, naturally enticed Palestine's first generation of 20th century artists to paint them. But why did not only Jabra, but his contemporaries, who you're seeing here, like Nicolas Saig, Zulfa Saadi, and Sophie Halabi, among others, present Palestine and its botanical bounty, when I'm talking today about its flora palestina, as unharmed, serene, and intact, during the turbulent decades leading up to the Nakba, How did these paintings respond, if at all, to the transformations to Palestinian life and land during the British Mandate and the rise of Zionism? Now to me, the sheer volume of still lifes uh, and botanical illustrations we have of Flora Palestina suggests that there was demand for them. Unlike art markets uh, developing elsewhere at this time, Palestine's late 19th and early 20th century art market was extraordinarily tied to the region's robust religious souvenir market, filled with objects that most tourists perceived as sacred merely by dint of having been produced on or from Palestinian soil. Grown directly from that sacred soil, Palestine's actual botanical specimens circulated wi widely within this market. 
Wildflowers, ferns, thistles, and thorns were picked, pressed, and arranged within special olive wood bound albums or affixed to greeting cards, as they still are today. Compositionally, the botanical arrangements often evoked biblical and Roman motifs, and some, I believe, even endeavor to narrate biblical events through the medium of dried wildflowers and pliable stems. The enthusiasm for Palestine's wildflowers was due in no small measure to the rise of the scriptural scientific field of biblical botany, this discipline, and the wide circulation of both academic and popular books on the subject, just a very small sliver of which you're seeing here. This discipline aimed to parse the meaningful, yet oftentimes very vague, phrasings found in the Bible. For instance, attempts to determine which flower to honor as the biblical lily of the valley required considerable sleuthing, as the Bible mentions lilies 15 times and found growing in various habitats. Whereas followers of Linnaeus, which we heard about a little bit from Dr. Mitri uh, earlier this week, followers of Linnaeus, of course, learned the importance of determining a type specimen, a singular example by which all others would be identified in comparison. Scholars of biblical botany had only God's word from which to identify biblical type specimens. And this challenge sparked a lively discourse among theologians, geologists, and naturalists who were often one and the same forming an interdisciplinary field of biblical botany by the mid-19th century. Uh, and just as a side note, by 1930, Hebrew University had a museum of biblical botany on its campus. The notion that Palestinian artists painted Palestinian wildflowers because of an extant market for representations of biblical botany seems likely. And examples like the printed colored postcards of Halabi's botanical watercolors in particular expose her keen awareness of the norms of botanic scientific illustration, as the specimens often float in space with nothing to distract from careful study of stems, thorns, leaves, and petals. The popularity of biblical botany might also explain, I think, some of the more enigmatic experiments within the works of Palestinian artists of this period, such as this sketch by Nicholas Seig, an oil sketch of the passion flower, which is an arresting specimen native to South America and therefore not really within the traditional can canon of biblical botany, but was so named by Spanish Christian missionaries who saw in its parts symbols of the passion of Christ and brought it to Palestine. So while not grown from Palestine's sacred soil, the passion flower instead represented events that took place on its sacred ground. With such works, Palestinian artists responded to market trends, creating artworks that participated in Palestine's particular religious souvenir market at the turn of the 20th century. But to return to this painting, Jabra's nebulous anemones, however, are nothing like the highly articulated flowers in Sayeg's or Halabi's works that we just saw. Further, Halabi's own large-scale wa watercolor still lifes are so different from her botanical postcards, to my eye, distinguished by the looseness of her brushwork as set against the economy of the sketchy and swirling black lines that she adds to delineate the flower's forms, but which really start to lose their coherence upon close view. Relinquishing scientific information in favor of expression, such works prompt other considerations. At the turn of the 20th century, Palestinians expressed their connection and knowledge of Flora Palestina in a variety of ways. Women stitched floral designs in tatris, embroidery patterns, doctors sourced flowers and plants for their palliative properties, and villagers participated in yearly festivals celebrating local plant life. Throughout the period of the British Mandate, however, Palestinians began pursuing botanical knowledge in new ways. According to Halabi, uh, in an interview she did with Samia Halabi. Uh, her interest in drawing flowers really began when she was a student at the Jerusalem Girls College, a secondary school founded by Anglican mis missionaries at the end of the First World War. The school's art teacher would often shuttle the students into Palestine's hills to record their observations. Studying Palestine's native plants not only resonated with her Christian teacher's affinity for biblical botany, and likely her own, uh, but functioned within a curriculum aiming to connect academic subjects with the domestic arts. Students, especially uh, uh, female students, observed and collected wildflowers in order to later learn how to dry and arrange them for the home or stitch them uh, images of them onto cloth. 
Halabi's British teachers brought with them to Palestine the early 20th century concept of the new women, and their curriculum very much aligned with the priorities of many middle-class Palestinian families, influenced by Ottoman and Arab reformers, uh, such as Qasem Amin, who emphasized the idea that women educated in both the domestic and the academic spheres would uplift and reform the family and the nation, a quote from Qasem Amin. And botany was one subject that became notably responsible for uniting the girls' training for home life with national life. Uh, I don't know if I have uh, time to read this poem, but it's a great poem by a, a high school student at the time where she describes her development as uh, like a seedling who is now blossoming. Beyond school hours, Palestinians also fostered their attachment to nature through shatat, or outings, wherein families and groups of friends would walk, picnic, and collect flowers while enjoying the fresh air of Palestine's hills. Adding scientific vigor to this contemporary popular interest, Palestinian intellectuals analyze the role of botanicals in Palestinian life. For example, the respected doctor and ethnographer who we heard about earlier today, Taufik Kanan, investigated the practices and ancestral attachments Palestinians had to the land. Uh, for example, in an article he wrote on plant lore in Palestinian superstition in 1928. Kanan, in that piece, described a joyousness among Palestinians that derived from being in an interdependent relationship with nature, a contentedness that I think is reflected in uh, photographs such as these, as well as in the serenity of the seated women in Jabra's field of anemones and Halabi's uh, exuberant waterflower, wildflower still life. Indeed, the school uh, field trips Halabi took to the Palestinian hillsides to pick flowers closely mirrored these outings. Their purpose, while rooted in the Christian veneration of biblical botany, was similarly intended to nurture a sense of rootedness and belonging and to promote civic-minded thinking through encouraging reverence for one's surroundings. Such training provided a basis for young artists in Palestine to extend the scope of their visual botanical experiments from the realm of science to that of artistic and ultimately communal and national expression. Yet the terrain of communal expressions through botany was not free from competition in this period. Palestinian artists devoted attention to Flora Palestina at the same time as Zionists enlisted botany to naturalize the Jewish right to a national homeland in Palestine, as I was alluding to before. But I think nowhere was this more transparent then at the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts, the first Zionist art school funded by Lithuanian Jewish artist Boris Schatz in Jerusalem in 1906. Schatz was inspired and wrote about it as such uh, to establish the school by Martin Buber's address on Jewish art given at the Fifth Zionist Congress in 1901, in which Buber positioned art as the antidote to the quote, barren nature of Jewish life, which he saw as reflected in the, quote, desert of the historic Jewish land, or Palestine. Schatz's Betzalel school, he argued, would create an institutional framework for Buber's vision, with the study of Palestine's ecology as vital in the creation of a new artistic style, which he sometimes called Hebrew style, sometimes Palestine style, sometimes Jewish style, um, a new artistic style meant to revive the young buds, uh, as he calls it, of Jewish life. Schatz established a botanical department as well as a nature museum at the school's founding, uh, one of the first things he did, and encouraged Betzalel's teachers and students to embrace Palestine's native flowers, trees, insects, and animals, which became recurrent motifs in their earliest designs, alongside the more recognizable Jewish motifs like the menorah and the Star of David, uh, motifs that were recently adopted by the Zionist movement. Classes in plant drawing taught students to incorporate botanical specimens into their designs for textiles and decorative objects, and even into their experiments with Hebrew letters forms, um, if you can see in the upper right hand side of the photograph. A people, their religion, language, and culture were uh, rooting, rerooting in Palestine, and Schatz guided Betzalel based on his belief that through connecting with nature, Jewish artists would evoke the promised land of yore to imagine their future national homeland, nullifying centuries of Jewish history lived in diasporic, exilic, 
wastelands, as described by someone like Buber. Jewish artists found in Flora Palestina a core tool through which they could express Zionist national efforts, both those still hoped for and those already actualized. Images, I argue, of botanical nationalism in painted form. While deeply intertwined with the world and the world, uh, sorry, I'll leave it here, world and the word of the Bible, Flora Palestina was thus becoming embedded into the world of contemporary politics of the 1930s. British mandate bureaucrats, uh, for their part, recognized the botanical realm's po political potentials uh, with the Department of Forestry drafting a law on the protection and preservation of wild plants in 1930. And this effort echoed public calls that were being made uh, in many newspaper articles at the time by uh, British and Zionist residents to form a society for protection of wildflowers. They accused those who picked wildflowers of having no knowledge of the life, cycle, life cycles and propagation methods of plants, carelessly destroying Palestine's ecosystem for pleasure and profit. Uh, such declarations underscored how certain people and entities began seeing themselves and not others as the rightful custodians of the land, very carefully coupling the idea of botanical care to proprietary belonging. So to conclude, I'd like to reflect once more on Jabra's Arcadian painting, Field of Anemones. Soon after Jabra painted this work in the mid-1940s, the idea of sitting unbothered in Palestine among fields of anemones would, for Palestinians at home and in exile, become not only unimaginable, but impossible. I believe Jabra returned to this vision nearly 40 years later, after his, or 40 years after his forced exile from Palestine, in his 1985 novel, The Ship, when the book's Palestinian protagonist asks his sailing companions uh, achingly, and I apologize for not including the Arabic here as well, have you ever sat down on the red earth under an old knotted, knotted olive tree surrounded by thorn bushes and a few anemones that fought their way out through the strangling thorns? Nothing is equal to that red rocky land that greets your feet like a lover's kiss. And when you lie down on it, it provides you with all the comfort of a bed in paradise. To be an exile from your own land is a curse, the most painful curse of all. The Palestinian homeland, or to be more faithful to Jabra's prose here, paradise, recorded by Jabra's pen in the in 1980s, is nearly identical to the Palestinian homeland captured by Jabra's brush in the 1940s. Just as the windswept field of anemones in Jabra's painting gently cushion the woman's body, the book's protagonist describes how a jagged, rock-strewn landscape transforms into a gentle caress for the one who calls that patch of land home. The pain of exile, Jabra therefore implies, does not merely arise from being physically removed from place, but from one's symbiosis with the, with the nature of one's homeland being permanently altered. I think a binary results from this thinking. If the ecology of home is welcoming, comfortable, and soft, the ecology of exile is inhospitable, hostile, and hard and cold. Certainly the conception of home as a lost Eden and the uncertain space of exile as a deserted, wretched earth resonates with ecologies of the broader post-colonial imagination as the expansive, extractive, and violent human and environmental policies of colonialism and settler colonialism has left people, to use Franz Fanon's evocative phrasing, quote, wallowing in the mire. In the field of Palestinian painting after the Nakba, Perhaps no canvas expressed this ecology of exile better than Ismail Shamut's iconic painting in which a weary Palestinian man and emaciated children wander under a tawny, de wander a tawny desert scape with only a single desiccated tree to shade them. Prior to the Nakba, however, it was British bureaucrats and Zionists who most often described Palestine as a wasteland in order to justify their colonial interests and they looked to botanical learning, representation, care, and even control as a way to assert political claims on Palestinian land. Therefore, might it be possible for us to see that a portrayal of the opposite, uh, projecting the Palestinian homeland as an abundant, fertile, promised land in harmony with Palestinian life, 
was anti-colonial in its approach, even if not always explicitly in intention. In creating these seemingly uncomplicated paradisiacal pictures, Palestinian painters countered or even erased the transformations and damage imposed by colonial and settler colonialism and proclaimed through the diligent and conscientious practice of artistic observation of Flora Palestina and the land that it's rooted in, that for Palestinians, Palestine's land was homeland. It was in this sense, I argue, that to paint an ecology of home was to embody an anti-colonial ecology. Jabra's pre-Nakba serene painting of anemones in his homeland, in other words, the point I uh, want to discuss with you today, I think is neither the ecological nor the political opposite of Shamut's post-Nakba desert of exile, or even the current groundswell of today's ecologically oriented artworks um, by artists like Mirna Bamye, Nida Sinakrot, Jumanam Anna. They are instead, I believe, their precursors. Thank you. Thank you.